by the Center for Planetary Science and Exploration. It's a center on campus that is uh, aimed at fostering interdisciplinary research in planetary science and exploration. And so for many years, this lecture has very much focused on planetary science, and I admit that's a bias of mine. Many other researchers here, but I am extremely pleased tonight to be able to start being able to talk about the exploration part of our center by having a very distinguished lecturer tonight in the form of Dr. Bob Richards. Uh, so Dr. Richards has done a lot of things. It's a question of where to start. He's he's a Canadian, although on the call today he's he's referred to more often as Canadian born as opposed to being Canadian. So he did study uh, did aerospace engineering, he also studied physics and astronomy here in Canada. But since then, he's gone off and done an awful lot of other things. He's founded the International Space University, so anybody who's the least bit familiar with uh, space studies, international space studies, will know ISU now is a very large international footprint. Lots of, uh, I would say, almost all the, the graduates from ISU have gone on to do all kinds of really cool stuff in space. So he's one of the original founders of ISU. He's also right at the forefront of this new wave of space commercialization. So uh, he's going to talk to us tonight about a number of things related to this, but I think this is a, a very cool aspect to the whole emerging space. You know, we all think NASA, and we're going to the moon, and we're going to Mars. NASA's going to do it. Eh, maybe not. Maybe it's going to be done more commercially. And uh, Bob really is at the center of that new way of looking at things. Uh, in terms of commercial space. He's down in Silicon Valley now, and so he was telling us over lunch how you walk around Silicon Valley and all the billionaires are walking around with you know, their backpacks. And I guess you just over lunch hit them up and say, hey, I've got this idea for a space company. You're the one billionaire that doesn't have a space company, but I got an idea for you. So Bob is, is right on top of that whole scene, and tonight he's going to share with us uh, some thoughts about the future of space, manned flight in space, commercial space, and Whatever else uh, tickles his fancy. So, <laughs> Bob Richard. Thanks. All right, so it's great to be here at during spring in Canada. <laughs> Everybody was telling me how beautiful it was up here this week, and I flew up on Wednesday. Of course, arrived just at the height of the blizzard. I was hitting Pearson that day and circled for about an hour, and then finally made it down to the runways and then waited for another half hour to find a gate and then hit the roads. And what a welcome. I hadn't been <laughs> And I, I'd been down in uh, Silicon Valley. Uh, all, well, I was trying to miss the winter, but my strategy didn't work. <laughs> I, but I hadn't been here since uh, since Christmas, actually. So thank you for the, the Christmas for free. I really appreciate that. <laughs> and always good to be back back here in London and, and at the uh, University of uh, Western Ontario. Um, I always feel welcome here. A lot of my, uh, a lot of ISU people are here. How many people in the audience are actually associated with the ISU or have lectured or been students or anything like that? So we have, we have a few. Um, for those of you who are hearing about the International Space University for the first time, I'll, I'll plug it relentlessly, probably throughout the, throughout the evening. Um, and as far as the evening goes, uh, what, how much time do we actually have? Uh, is it six hours? Seriously, <laughs> 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 breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> About an hour, there's also reception. Hour and reception. So, um, I'd like to try to have a conversation and leave, leave some time for that. Uh, so, maybe people could help me because I kind of went over time today <laughs> inadvertently. I got excited and wouldn't shut up. Um, so, when we hit the you know, 7 30, 20 to 8 mark, would people just like <laughs> give, me the, give me the sign and I'll, I'll, I'll try to uh, turn it back into a conversation? Uh, I'm very excited about uh, a lot of things as, as introduced, but most importantly, I'm excited about creating a future which uh, A, increases the chances of the survival of the human race. That's just part of my, for some reason, my DNA. Uh, but also to do so in a way that improves the style of living and the standard of living for every human being and other life form on this particular planet as we go to create other worlds uh, where we live. Uh, you know, throughout, I th think, all life, there is this percentage of each species that has this exploration gene. I'm not a 
biotechnologist, but I'm just suggesting that perhaps there's something in our DNA and in all life's DNA that needs to explore. So there's the there's the crazies, the small percentage of society that really wants to see what's beyond that horizon, that wants to take the risk of going somewhere else. Um, you know, if 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 uh, species just stayed in one place, eventually, I mean, you're, you're it's a it's a it's a focus for disaster, right? You're in the crosshairs of something. Those species that find their way to explore and adapt and evolve tend to proliferate. So as life proliferates across planet Earth, um, and as human beings have done so almost like relentlessly for the past uh, few thousand years, um, maybe there's something that drives us, and maybe there's a few of us in thinking as I try to rationalize the motivates me. Uh, that have this exploration gene expressed more strongly than in others. A lot of people are just happy the way things are. Um, I just not. And, and many of my, the people in my kind of tribe, my ecosystem of people that are interested in space and space exploration and the idea of evolving the human species into a multi-planet species, um, I, I think have this kind of expressed exploration gene as well. Um, how many people in this audience have been to space? <laughs> and very honored to have you here. Um, and my answer is not yet, right? But the thing that's different um, is in our generation, I can say, but I, I know I'm going to go because uh, I don't, I don't need to uh, go through somebody else's filter and process and, you know, if I have the will, I can find the means and I can buy a ticket soon. Not quite yet. Well, I can buy a ticket now, but I'm going to have to wait for a little bit before I can go. But very, very soon I'll be able to just go. Um, you and me will be able to go. So it's, it's, and I think the people that are attracted to these, uh, what's being called kind of the personal space flight revolution, we'll talk a little bit about that, um, maybe have this innate exploration gene to kind of maybe dormant and they've been, they really want to do something like this, they feel this desire to reach out. So it's that part of humanity that will want to explore space, it's the ones that will you know, live the hard life in the hard way in space, which it will be hard at first. You know, it's, it's kind of submarine mentality right now, um, the technology. But eventually it'll be nice living in space. Not because, not, perhaps not because we've created environments that are much better adapted to humans, but perhaps we'll have created humans which are much better adapted to the environments. So so that's a that's a theme that I want to talk to us I want us to talk about tonight as well. Because it's not just about making space fit for humans, it's also about making humans fit for space. And any medical people in the audience? Great, so I can talk about things and not be called out. <laughs> um, but there is, uh, you know, the adaption of, of species happens very quickly, um, especially in isolation, right? So, so part of evolution is really inspired by isolating the species or in, a, in an environment that it is adapting to. And we find in space flight that the human body changes quite rapidly. Um, so, but we don't have en enough long duration space flight experience to understand how far this adaptation actually goes. Um, Garney, I'm sure you have your own thoughts about this. Uh, but we will learn how it goes and, and we will be able to enhance the way that it goes. Um, you know, one day that when there is a splinter of human beings, Homo, sap homo sapiens, that actually venture out into space, there is the chance that we will actually branch a new um, subspecies, Homo sapiens, we might call it, <laughs> of, uh, of humanity, because we will adapt. So our descendants on other worlds, on multi planet, you know, will have um, will have merged with our machines, will have become something else, something more adaptive. So I see a I see a future that uh, utilizes space in the short term. Uh, not just for fun and profit, although that's an important part of our Western civilization, but space used for ways that improves life on Earth for everyone. And and uh, the you know everything that we everything that we fight about here on Earth, 
all the scarce resources, all the limits to growth philosophy that we have, the land, right? the, 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 the energy resources, everything that we fight about on Earth is available in, in infinite quantity outside the Earth, in space. And we often forget that we actually do live in a spaceship called Earth, which is in an environment which is completely saturated with energy and resources. And yet we're like in this kitchen fighting over this crumb when this complete orchard of food and resources surrounding us everywhere. Way more, there's even way more energy than we could possibly use, not just falling on the planet, but within the planet. So there, the, the, one of the greatest lies perpetrated in, in our modern society is this thing about an energy shortage. You know, there's no such thing as an energy shortage. It's, 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 it's the question is the technology that to, to embrace it and adapt it and distribute it in a more reasonable and rational way. So in, in the world that I'm privileged to live in, uh, working with amazing people who think about the future, um, you know, I live in this world about thinking about how do we make it better and how do we find the right balance of the government and private public center, uh, public private partnerships well, what is that right balance and how does it work well? Um, I also work in the international community with the International Space University and other organizations. And you know, we are very predisposed in kind of the Western cultures to think that our way is the only way. But it's not the only way. It's not, well, whether we think it's the only way or not, it's not the only way. It's not the only way that people think about things. So part of what we do at the International Space University is not only introduce people to a broad spectrum of disciplines, that you need to understand space, because you can't just be a rocket scientist, because you're going to run into a lawyer real quick, and they're going to tell you something you can't do, right? So, and, and, you have to, and, and, and you have to understand all these disciplines. But as important as that as a species, we have many cultures within the planet that we need to understand and cooperate with, and space by its very nature is international. You can't go to space without crossing everybody's border. So we teach at the International Space University this, this cultural imperative of understanding and bonding and, 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 um, and being patient and embracing other ways of viewing a similar problem. And it's, a, it's kind of a microcosm of humanity that we create, very motivated, well-meaning people, but people who don't necessarily look at problems in the same way because they come from different cultures. So it's very important as we move into space, I think space is actually a forcing function for humanity to learn how to work together. Um, the International Space Station has been beaten up a lot by you know, how long it's taken to put together and how much money it's taken. But if I could say anything positive about the ISS, um, led by the United States, of course, never before has a, as a, as a frontier been conquered without conquering somebody who's already there. So we've actually learned how to work together as a as a species, as humanity, and across all of these government and tech political, and, and you know, the boundaries are not necessarily technical, right? It's not necessarily the technical challenges that stop us from doing things. It's most often the political ones. So with, uh, with the current space station that's floating around the Earth, we've learned to at least do that and, and do things in space together. So that's, that's maybe a, a promising glimpse of what we can carry forward. So as I move into the presentation, and I really you know, creating a multi-planet civilization, there's a lot to think about. Um, we have a chance to do things in many ways for the first time in space, or maybe to redo them the right way. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the disadvantages in, in doing things in space is there really is no law. It's frontier law. It's, it's uh, uh, one of the, did I call it a disadvantage or an advantage? Because it's both. Um, and it's uh, not only a disadvantage and advantage that uh, there are no real, there, there's no, no such thing as space law, just like there's no such thing as international law, although it is a subject of study. Um, it's really generated through international treaties and the way that people, sovereign states, agree to do things together outside of their borders. And there's only a couple of uh, treaties, one in particular, the one that was signed in 1967 called the Outer Space Treaty, for short. Um, where governments agree in general framework of how they're going to work together in space. How many people were alive in 1967? <laughs> we see a few, but I'm not raising my hand. <laughs> so, uh, obviously a different era, right? Cold War stuff. Uh, the governments were mostly concerned with weapons of mass destruction. 
things that would blow things up, whole societies and perhaps continents and species. And uh, there's a worry about not that, that we don't want space to become a dominion of war. That was kind of the culture back in the 60s. So this big treaty was written about not putting weapons of mass destruction in space. The thing that was completely absent from it, understandably, I guess, was there's absolutely no comprehension or anticipation that one day commercial and private players would be in space. So the, the agreement is completely silent on commercial activity. And some people think that's a loophole, but others point out that you can't really be an individual or a corporation outside of the sovereign laws from which you are actually born or created. So there is an incumbent um, uh, flow down of this treaty down to people and corporations. Most people, I think, agree to that. But the actual um, occupancy and activities that people and companies representing the people, not governments, do in space, um, and over the next decade in particular, everybody's going to be doing things for the first time. So if there's going to be any law that's created in space, or on the moon, or on Mars, it's likely going to be an extension of common law, I would assert, um, that runs most of the ways that we generate laws and run countries and behave and learn how to get along and are punished if we don't uh, on planet Earth. And it's common law that doesn't uh, that has the premise of uh, not creating every law imaginable before it happens, but only to deal with cases as they arise. So everything that we start doing in space for the private sector and the commercial players, for instance, there will be one day the first commercial or private company to land on the moon. Only governments have done that so far. So what precedents are we going to be setting as we do those things? Those precedents will become case precedent for case law that will become enshrined and uh, perhaps debated, but that will that will be the forerunner of the actual law of the moon and, and how we behave. So it is a frontier opportunity to actually do things right, and, and there's a great incumbent responsibility on those who are trying to do things outside of the bounds of planet Earth um, to do it responsibly. Um, I, for one, think about this a lot. You might be getting that feeling. Um, even though it's a technical feat to send something to the moon, which occupies most of my waking hours and figuring out how to do that, not just really. it's not a technical problem, believe me. <laughs> it's it's a business plan problem, and it's a political problem. It's a financial problem. We know, te technically, we, the human species, know how to go to the moon. We did it 40 years ago. <coughs> so there's been no physics invented since then. Um, there's been some technologies that make it maybe, um, maybe a little easier, um, but it's still a very hard thing to do. But it's the political, financial aspects of doing anything outside of the economic sphere of Earth that's really, really tough. And those are the things that I think about. But uh, on top of the, you know, the technical fun of figuring out how to do it, is I feel a very heavy responsibility uh, as we plan what we're going to do on the moon and elsewhere that we think about the things that we are setting the precedent for the way that we are behaving, the way that we are, um, the way that we are expressing ourselves as, as we evolve to the people that come after us. So that's kind of the context of the, the way that my projects are going these days. Let me give you a little bit of a background with a little bit of show and tell um, about uh, the things that I think are leading to a multi-planet civilization and that I'm working towards. And then we'll talk a little bit uh, back and forth. So. You know, we started with some music, that wasn't a bad thing. Um, what I want you to think about is, you know, space takes a long time. Um, gosh, you know, 60s were in space, humans, before that with a robot. Um, where will we be 50 years from now? If, like, 50 years ago we really just started doing space, where will we be 50 years from now? Will we be this civilization which has kind of turned its back on on space and have really focused on our problems here on, on Earth? Will we just be planet Earth worried about our, our sort of two-dimensional issues and problems? Or you know, will we actually have evolved out of our experiences with the International Space Station and created more installations, perhaps government, perhaps private, perhaps some hybrid, and actually be occupying nearer space? 
and having uh, some sort of economy or activity. Will we actually have ventured to other worlds, set up outposts, maybe even pre-colony type situations? Could be Mars. Could we have actually ventured out to the outer planets and have presence in humanity, lower orbit, moon, Mars, outer planets, really be expe uh, extending ourselves throughout the solar system? Now, if you want to think like really big, um, maybe we've actually expanded out of our solar system into the galaxy and discovered others. So maybe we actually have discovered within 50 years that we're just not alone, that we're part of this galactic community that was just sort of waiting for us to grow up. You know, there might be some big welcome sign out there as soon as we reach a certain level of society. We don't know. Um, but it might be out there. So the idea of life expanding throughout the universe, um, it could already be there. Or, you know, which is kind of like a really metaphysical cool thought, like maybe it's all teeming with life and we're just, we're just waiting for us to get our act together. Um, or maybe we're the first ones. Somebody's got to be first. The length of the evolution of the universe measured in billions and billions of years, who said that? Um, was, uh, you know, there's been chance for many civilizations to sort of come and go. We've been around for, as a technical civilization, for what, a hundred years? You know, as, as a kind of a, as a um, civilization of maybe 2,000? I mean, we're just, in geological time, it's been nothing, we just started. So what are the chances that we're the first? We don't know, because we don't have, we don't have incontrovertible proof right now that life actually exists outside of planet Earth. We have compelling evidence that it does. I'm a believer, but science doesn't work on belief, right? Science works on evidence and hypothesis and proven fact as opposed to what you want it to be. So where will we be in 2050? Well, you know, we're starting here. We certainly know that life is abundant on planet Earth. This may be the only place in the entire 15 billion years and whatever it is now of the universe and trillions of stars. This may be the only place where life is arising. And, and starting to understand its environment, becoming self-aware, and just beginning, just in the past decades, to reach beyond the planet, learn how to leave the planet, right? As life goes out of planet Earth, as we humans venture out of planet Earth, um, we're taking a lot of what life is with us, what the planet is with us. You know, it gets down to what is the definition of life. You know, life is usually defined as something that has molecular, chemical complexity, uh, reproduces, and uh, makes little life. Right? So uh, you know, what about planet Earth? I mean, if you look at planet Earth as an organism, you know, it does metabolize and it is chemically complex, but does Earth, you know, is Earth alive as a system? You know, we're not just one body, we are a combination of life forms symbiotically cooperating, all of them unlike each other that create this thing we call a human being, but if you look at the Earth as a living life form, does it reproduce is the question, right? It's really, because it does metabolize, it is complex, but does it reproduce? And ah, space colonies, right? Maybe we're not, maybe we're kind of like a functional enzyme in a much larger plan for life. Uh, and because uh, when you do a space colony with human beings, you know, we take a lot of the, we take the air with us, we take microbes with us, we take plants with us, we're going to take animals, so we take a lot of kind of Earth with us. So as we leave Earth, you know, we start to see a perspective that we didn't used to have. So the first time astronauts ventured a long way from Earth when they first went to the moon, the first time they saw Earth in the distance where you could cover it with your thumb, it really, you know, from the people that I know and friends of ours and the Apollo program, this was a almost a spiritual experience to see Earth descending into the background. I think what it would be like as you get farther and farther away from Earth, what that must really feel like. What would that sense be? You know, when this photograph was taken, um, the Voyager spacecraft, as it passed Saturn, uh, my mentor, friend, teacher, Carl Sagan, was on the imaging team. And when he saw this picture, it, it inspired him to think in this way, and he called it the pale blue dot. 
And the pale blue dot, which he was thinking about at the time, inspired him to write uh, a sequence, and actually eventually a book called The Pale Blue Dot, about the sense of serenity, but the sense of loneliness that we have as a species. What I'd like to do is just take a minute here and listen to Carl's words talk about the pale blue dot. From this distant vantage point, the Earth Although might not seem of any particular interest. But for us, it's different. Consider again that dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was, lived out their lives. The aggregate or joy and suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there on the mode of dust suspended in a sunbeam. The earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena. Think of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors so that in glory and triumph they can become the momentary masters of a fraction of a dot. Think of the endless cruelties visited by the inhabitants of one corner of this pixel on the scarcely distinguishable inhabitants of some other corner. How frequent their misunderstandings. How eager they are to kill one another. How fervent their hatreds. Our postures, our imagined self-importance, the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe, are challenged by this point of pale light. Our planet is a lone speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. In our obscurity, in all this vastness, there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. The Earth is the only world known so far to harbor life. There is nowhere else, at least in the near future, to which our species could migrate. Visit? Yes. Settle? Not yet. Like it or not, for the moment, the Earth is where we make our stand. It has been said that astronomy is a humbling and character-building experience. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image of our tiny world. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the big blue dot, the only home we've ever known. Imagine how cool it was to be uh, talked by Carl. Um, sobering, cosmic sort of thoughts, but you know, very poignant. And and as we move out beyond even our planetary solar system, we go beyond the planets into the realm of the galaxy, the Milky Way. Um, think of what that's going to be like for the descendants of human beings when not just our world, the Earth, our home world, but our entire solar system, the Sun, becomes lost in this universe of universes. I think I would get scared. <laughs> I don't know about you guys. But I feel this, you know, as I was even just looking at images of astronomy, I feel this sense of kind of lost 
out there, and and you and you want to get back home. I mean, doesn't that feel better? Okay. So, to create a multi-planet civilization, we as a species, we as people, um, need to learn how to deal with a lot of things. Not just the technology of it, but the psychology of it could be more powerful a hindrance to becoming a multi-planet civilization than the technical barriers that uh, we will overcome. I mean, it's just engineering, guys. I mean, we just have to build this stuff. There's nothing we really, really don't know how to do. But what we're completely void is our knowledge about the psychology of a human being being completely separated from not just their family, but the entire human race. You know, there are places in the solar system very close by the other side of the moon. And despite what Pink Floyd thinks, there is no dark side. Right? It's, it's, it's illuminated just as much as the near side of the moon, so we'll call it the far side of the moon, although it's not a comic strip either. Um, the far side of the moon has this chance for us, I propose, to actually experiment with this. You know, if you have kids, right, and, and they want, like young kids, and they want to go camping, and they say, I want to go up to a golf park, mom and dad, you send your seven-year-old, say, absolutely, go up and have fun. No, because you know that they don't know, right? You know a lot of stuff they don't know that they think they know, but they're not going to know until they know they don't know it. <laughs> um, so what you do is you, is you send them into the backyard, right? They set up the tent in the backyard, and they're all excited, and they get in the tent, and you know, mom and dad are like you know, looking through the, the blinds in the kitchen, and then they think, we forgot our flashlight. So they run back in the house, and they get the flashlights, right? And then they forgot something else. So they're always close to home. They can run back and forth. And we know that the Calvary mom and dad is just waiting to jump in if something really goes wrong. You practice in the backyard before you commit the risk of losing life far beyond where it is recoverable or that is beyond the reach of help. The moon is such a place that it's within the Calvary zone of planet Earth, but it also has a very unique uh, feature that one side of the moon always faces the Earth, and one and the other side of the moon, the far side, always faces away from the Earth. So if you're on the far side of the moon, it's the same night-day cycle as if you were on the near side. The only difference is you can't see the Earth. You're forever completely cut off. There's a whole world between you and the Earth. So you have no radio signals. You have no visuals. You're completely cut off. So, But it's kind of like the backyard. Because there's only, you know, the Calvary and mom and dad and the rest of the planetary species is only kind of over the horizon a few days away. So it's a good place to practice before we go to the cosmic equivalent of a golf park, which would be Mars, right? I mean, that's far away. But as far as camping goes, it's the real thing, right? You just have to build up to it. So I think in becoming a multi-planet species, we've been gifted a very unique situation with planet Earth, and that it's not a single planet. We actually have a two-planet system. The Earth-Moon system are actually sister worlds. Now, it's not just the, the existence of space you know, that, that we have to contend with as we talk about a multi-planet civilization, but we have to understand the timelines involved and how life is evolving in the universe, in a, which has underlying um, variables of exponentials, right? Life is not linear. Life is exponential. One way to try to grasp that is uh, this comes again from Carl Sagan's Cosmos series. If you haven't seen it or you haven't heard about it, please look it up. And it's kind of it's kind of 80s and a little old school, but you know what? It's it's pretty good, and it and it really holds up very well. If you forgive the corduroy jacket and. <laughs> Some old technology. Um, the point he makes in the book and in the series, TV series, you take the 15 or so billion years of the universe and compress it into one year, just to try to get, just to try to imagine something that's scalable in our mind. Imagine a year, and the entire history of the universe is compressed into that year. So on, you know, January 1st, the beginning of the year, everything begins. Let's call it the Big Bang or the Big Something. Right? Something happens. The universe appears. So when you think about, if you go through January, and it's not until the, not until August, right? 
eight months later that our solar system kind of starts to appear out of the gas and the, and the sun starts to coalesce and turns on and planets begin to form. And it isn't until four months later, November of the year, 11, you know, 11 months of the 12, that life begins to arise on Earth. You know, only two months, if today is the end of the year, if you're watching uh, December 31st, then it's in November that the first uh, uh, multicellular organisms begin. And then look at December. Okay, so everything up until the end of November led to multicellular organisms on Earth. And then if you just look at the month of December, life evolves, and, but, and the dinosaurs appear on Christmas Eve. And our first mammalian ancestors on Christmas Day. The birds appear a couple of days later. The dinosaurs leave on December 29th. Something wipes them out. And it's in, you see the panel on the lower right here. It's in the last two hours of that year that things that appear remotely human, hominids, appear. And it isn't until the last seconds, the last 10 seconds of the year, the pyramids are built. In the last second, before midnight, Christopher Columbus sails. Right? That's all of our technical history. It's less than one second in the year, right, that's taken to evolve. But look at the exponential, right? Everything's everything's crunched up. And it, it didn't stop, you know, at now. It's going to continue exponentially. So life is wanting to proliferate. And where we're going to go is we're going to go into space. I talked about the moon as as Earth's sister world, you know, and, and we're privileged and lucky, in my view, that we have a, that we live on a planet that actually has uh, an unusual situation where it has a very large co-planet, another world, sister world, just on the horizon. It's like kind of like a planetary archipelago, right? If you're if you live on an island and you can't see anything across, the, like everywhere you look, it's just water. You don't know where to go. But if there's another island just on the horizon, right, just like the Polynesians did, yeah, where do you go? You go to that island, right? And you and you find out how to travel across the, the ocean and you develop the technologies that get you back and forth. And that's the type of opportunity we have with the moon. It's like the eighth continent. And the moon, as far as the world goes, is pretty big. If you if you if you put the land mass of all of the Americas together, that's about the size of the moon. It's a stepping stone. I will, I, I'm a Mars lover. You know, I, I, I was inspired, obviously, by Sagan, who was a big Mars guy. So I love Mars. <laughs> I mean, I was involved in the Canadian mission that went to Mars, the Phoenix mission. It was uh, my company's technology, Optech, that developed this LiDAR system that actually discovered snow falling on Mars for the first time. Did you hear those headlines? The Canadians discovered snow on Mars. <laughs> How appropriate. <laughs> um, but that was kind of cool. And uh, it was a lifelong dream. Um, but I think the moon is this kind of not a step, just a stepping stone to to Mars and other places for multi-planet civilization to grow. But it's also a Rosetta Stone. One of the uh, one of the aspects of Earth that keeps us alive is that it's it's got weather and it's, it always changes and it kind of erases the, one of the curiosities of trying to look back into the history of the Earth and our civilization is that the evidence gets wiped out over time, right? Because because of just the standard effects of weather and erosion and, and earthquakes and tsunamis and all of this stuff happening, the data that we're looking for gets convoluted, crushed, sometimes completely devastated and wiped out. On the moon, it's different. The moon doesn't have the weather. It doesn't have, not anymore, it doesn't have the, the, uh, the, the uh, geophysical type properties that move things around and lava and all that stuff that tends to like heat things. Um, so there's this record on the moon, like a Rosetta Stone. Of the of the history of the Earth Moon system, that's that's captivated there. So there's a really good science to learn about unlocking the history of the Earth Moon system. Science and knowledge waiting to be explored. I said I love Mars. I think the Moon is a stepping stone. I think as far as Mars goes, it is the most Earth-like planet. It's a place of extreme diversity. It has you know comparative planetology is the thing that I studied at, at Cornell. It's the idea of of learning about our world by studying others. It's kind of, you have one petri dish and nothing else to compare it to. It's really hard to understand how systems work. But when you go outside of Earth and you look at other planets and you compare it back to Earth, um, you can learn about Earth. So I think it's a very important place for us to go. 
And one of the key questions I, I get excited about, and some, a friend of mine and many of ours, Chris McKay, asks all the time, is that, you know, does life exist on Mars? And does it exist because it came from Earth? Does Earth life exist because it came from Mars? Because rocks are traded all the time. And there's somewhat controversial evidence that there may be microbes and then there are rocks, you know, that kind of cross-pollinate life. Or is it possible that there's a second genesis of life? Is it possible that life has arisen on Mars, you know, completely independently? So we could actually, all life on Earth is, is connected, right? As far as our evidence goes. Everything is connected. There might be ponds somewhere where Life seems to evolve from a different way, but I think it's maybe a branch, not an independent evolution. Um, but on Mars, there's a possibility there's a completely independent genesis of life. That would be cool. Now, there's another thing to worry about, you know, as a single planet species, is bad stuff happens every once in a while. Like, really bad stuff. Um, ask any dinosaur. <laughs> you know, because it's likely a big rock that hit the planet Earth that wiped out the dinosaur. Maybe not the the actual impact, you know, that would have been a bad day, for sure. But the aftermath of, of what this creates, right, completely devastates the planet. And it's not just one species. There, are, there have been times when, you know, 90 odd percent of the species on the planet, the entire, you know, was wiped out by these cosmic events. So the really bad things don't happen every day. Like, there's a really good chance we're not going to be wiped out by an asteroid next Tuesday. But there's a chance. Well, there's a really good chance it might. So, but we get hit by micrometeors all the time. So the, the smaller the rock is, the more often we get hit. So that's the way it kind of works, right? The bigger the rock, the less often it comes by. Because the evolution of the solar system really has you know, congealed and, and taken out a lot of the big rocks. But there are some that approach Earth, and there's still a problem. When we're a single point of failure, yet we're at risk, we need to have we need to expand our footprint, right? Even to the moon. And, and we now have the technologies to start backing up our civilization, right? Google can do it. <laughs> it's, you know, if, you know, there's a lot of stuff that you might think about the way that social networking is doing, but what thing it is doing is it's creating a constant story in our archive of what we are and who we are as human beings. And we're getting to the point that we could talk about actually backing up the bias on another world, and the moon's not a bad place to do it because it's a very benign environment, actually, um, to back up things. So that's a thought, right? What, what are we going to do if we're a single planet species forever? It's not going to be a good day one day. You know, and then you have global warming and these mass demonstrations in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> I show that slide in the US and I think it's really funny. Um, so, you know, there is, there's, there's the controversy about global warming. Is it, is it or isn't it? actually influenced by human beings. So I'm not going to get into that. That's not what tonight is about. But the conversation is important. And understanding other worlds helps us understand the way the processes have happened on Earth uh, much better. So it's an argument for comparative planetology. So as was alluded to at the beginning in the kind of going over, say I'm going over my time. Damn. Okay, so there's, and I can't spell exploration, but it means exploration. <laughs> it's the, I've invented a new word, it's exploration. <laughs> so the exploration of dichotomy. Um, you know, what way, what is the best, what way will we evolve? Not just what way should we evolve, but what way will we evolve? There's this dichotomy that's, that, that we have evidence of. We know that big government programs can get us into space, right? We know that a charismatic leader of one particular superpower can lay down a plan of getting the country, the United States in this case, from basically zero to the moon in less than a decade. And that's the challenge that President Kennedy laid down to the United States in 1961 when he said, we shall go to the moon, not because it's easy, but because it's hard, and we shall return a man safely to Earth. I don't know what had to, had to be a man, but it was a man, I guess back then, um, and do so within, within the decade. He had no right, really, you know, when you think about that political risk to make a statement and a challenge like that, because the technology didn't exist, and the technology that was needed to create the technologies, the materials, nothing existed. Everything had to be invented. But it was done, right? It was done in 1969. Despite what, you know, some people think Hollywood can do, they didn't do this. <laughs> These were real people, and we know them. I know them. The audience knows them. 
right? These are real people. And if you want to walk up to Buzz Aldrin and, and challenge him <laughs> about whether he actually went to the moon or not, I would say duck before you ask. Because, and, you can, and you can look on YouTube to see what I mean. Um, believe me, he went. To the moon. And then you look at what the governments do, you know, so, that, so uh, although the U.S. has changed, it's uncertain now, a couple of years ago, um, they wanted to go back to the moon. And they started programs that are still in place today. The Constellation Program, it's called, and it, and, it, and it had come up with a new infrastructure for going back to the moon. So, you know, they invested billions of dollars, and they thought really hard, and what did they come up with? Apollo, <laughs> basically, a bigger Apollo. So, it, you know, this, some people might say, well, common engineering challenges lead to common solutions. Okay, but with billions of dollars and tens of thousands of people working on it, the thought process led to the same solution. So maybe there's another way of thinking about it that that type of paradigm can't come up with. And we have evidence that there's another way of doing it. My colleague and co-conspirator, Peter Diamandis, created the XPRIZE Foundation in 1996, challenged the world to come up with new ways of getting to space, offered a $10 million prize for the first private company, privately sponsored team, to actually build a spaceship that could fly to space and back twice in two weeks. And, and it was in 2004 that the prize was won. Bert Rattan, funded by Paul Allen, Brian Binney was the, was the astronaut, but Spaceship One flew in 2004. You guys can watch it on YouTube if you don't know about it. And it was the first time that a private astronaut actually flew a spaceship into space and back. And yes, it was just suborbital. It wasn't around the Earth. That's how the government started too. Right, Shepard, if you look back at the history, first they started, you know, first trials or suborbital, and then they tried going around, and that's what the private sector will be doing too. So this led to the flight of Spaceship One, which is going to become Spaceship Two, which R Richard Branson invested in to create Virgin Atlantic, and, and another dot-com uh, billionaire, uh, Elon Musk, who had made his money on inventing PayPal with some friends and then sold to eBay for a few billion dollars. Uh, Elon is fond of saying, you know, I know how to make a million dollars in space. You start with a billion. <laughs> and it's kind of true. But um, he's, he invested a relatively minute amount of money. I mean, $150 million out of his own pocket compared to, like, the billions. That If you look at the Orion and what's going on into that, comparatively speaking, it was about $6 billion to get it to where it is. Elon and his company SpaceX and, and the other investors spent on the order of 600 million, but an order of magnitude less, to get the Dragon capsule, which looks a lot like a Apollo capsule because it is a common engineering design and solution. But to fly that last Christmas, you know, uh, robotically, successfully around the planet, it splashed down within, you know, a few hundred meters of where they wanted to splash down. A phenomenal achievement for a private sector company. So maybe there's a dichotomy here, the exploration economy, that we have to think about. And maybe it's not one or the other. Maybe there's a hybrid. So I'm not going to play the video I was going to play here. <laughs> but maybe we could do so later because I'm just, I just want to get to some Q's, Q and A's. But this is Buzz. And so you know why you know why most of the pictures of Apollo 11 are Buzz? Because he gave Neil the camera. He wasn't dumb, <laughs> right? He said, Neil, you take all the pictures, right? So. So most of the pictures, when it comes out in 1969 in the Apollo 9 landing, uh, were a buzz. And you can see Neil in his, reflected in his uh, helmet, actually taking, taking a photograph, standing on another world. So the, the moon, you know, the, so the Apollo program, inspired by government, got there with the United States. Uh, it was inspired by superpower politics and a completely different paradigm than is powering a private sector interest in space right now. Um, but as quickly as the... Apollo program had begun, you know, landed in 69, it was canceled in 1972, three years later. Three years later, at the end of Apollo 17, and there was another 18, and you'll see a movie about that soon, I think, um, there was a 17 that left, and the last man on the moon, uh, in 1972, and the program was shut down. And we thought, you know, been there, done that, it was the kind, even Obama said that, when he said, we're not going to do the moon program anymore, been there, done that, well, that is, and then we discover that the moon isn't this dumb, you know, life, not well, lifeless maybe, but um, resource limited world, is this a dumb rock? Well, it's not. You know, the recent probes going back to the moon, we've discovered that 
not only is there water on the moon in many forms, there are volatiles on the moon. It's almost like this cornucopia of everything that we kind of need to kind of live there. So, you know, what's the one thing you need when you go exploring another world? You know, the Americas, you have to know how to live off the land, right? Usually you like to have the stuff there that you can live off, if possible, not have to bring it all with you. So the moon is kind of representing that. It's not just a great exploration platform, but it also has stuff there that we can use. So the follow-on, I mean, what I'm really excited about these days is that after the Ansari X Prize was won in 2004, um, the X Prize Foundation wanted to offer the next space prize. So what do you do after you've sent the first private spaceship, you know, to space? Do you just send? You know, is the next challenge to go around the Earth, like kind of what, the progress of what the the um, governments did? Well, the X Prize Foundation decided no. They said nobody's going to know the difference between. Spaceship One going up into space and, and some other spaceship going around the Earth, it's just not big enough. It's not a big enough leap, right? So they said, let's do the moon. Google backed it, put $30 million on the table, and now um, there are 29 teams competing for the Google Lunar X Prize, and it's $30 million bucks for the first private team to reach the surface of the moon, take high definition YouTube stuff, and, and move 500 meters, not rove, but move <laughs> uh, 500 meters and take uh, more HD imagery. I've uh, formed two of the 29 teams that are competing in the prize. The very first one to uh, to sign up, which is called Odyssey Moon, and most recently the very stealth and mysterious Moon Express. And you can go right to a website and find out absolutely nothing about the company. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, what you'll find out is that somehow um, we kind of came out of the blue last August and won one of the uh, coveted uh, NASA lunar commercial contracts worth up to $10 million. And we also uh, announced that we're one of the contenders for Google and Xbox. Um, so I'm really eager to tell you more about it, but I just can't right now. We have some press releases and more information coming up very soon, so stay tuned. You know, we're going we're gonna to lay down some breadcrumbs and uh, probably sort of throw the, throw the veil off in the next few months of, of, uh, of who's back in Moon Express. Um, Good people are backing it. And it's a very exciting thing, and it's real. And it's not the only real team competing, but it's damn good. And, and we've got a great team, and, I, and uh, if all goes well, we'll be able to institute a learner commercial business plan that includes winning the X Prize, but has a much larger, a much larger vision of creating the first stepping stones to this multi planet civilization. Um, you know, so I, in, in my world, you know, it's the astropreneurs, you know, that are really redefining what's possible in space. It's, it's the new paradigm. Um, as was mentioned, I've, I've made Silicon Valley my home, and I've transitioned, I know, in blogs from Canadian Bob Richards to Canadian-born Bob Richards. That's what happens to Canadians who go south sometimes. But living in Silicon Valley, there's the ecosystem of, of not just capital, but, you know, crazy kids with backpacks that have billions of dollars and, and want to do something that's relevant and exciting and out of the box. And, and it's the place that, it's the only place that I've found on planet Earth that uh, has the right ecosystem in place to, to back these really high, high risk, high reward initiatives. Um, of course, the dark forces are uh, on our tail, but uh, I think we'll, we'll beat them out. So Moon Express, um, sorry about the red, white, and blue Canadians. Um, the only way to, uh, to win one of those NASA contracts that I told you about and that actually one of the reasons why Moon Express needed to be created um, is that NASA can only fund U.S. teams. It can't send money. I can't form a Canadian team. Odyssey Moon was actually not even a Canadian team. I formed it offshore in the out of man, of all places. Look that up. Um, but the uh, but I needed we need you need to be a U.S. team to win one of the NASA contracts. So that's why absolutely red, white, and blue for Moon Express. Um, I'll just close with the next couple of slides. Uh, this, I think, is an iconic uh, image of more to come. So this was uh, this is President Obama. You should recognize him. Right? <laughs> uh, and he had given a speech uh, last July. July, I think. July? Yeah. Something like that. April? Last spring. Um, he gave a speech, speech at the Kennedy Space Center talking about the new White House policy uh, embracing commercial space, where there's going to be a new paradigm of government and the private sector working together. And here's a picture of him walking out to the SpaceX launch pad at the Kennedy Space Center, walking beside 
Elon Musk, who was part Canadian, and went to Queens. So here's Elon and the president walking to the private rocket. And who's following? The NASA administrator. So I think that's a, I think that's really symbolic and iconic. Leave you with the thought of the uh, of the economic sphere of Earth. So you know, obviously, I'm inspired by exploration, curiosity. You know, what are the motivators of, of people doing things? You know, it's basically primarily motivators are greed, fear, curiosity. I have all of them. <laughs> I'm really curious. And you know, the fear, you know, you can actually measure the, the fear to curiosity mate, uh, uh, ratio. It's the ratio of the military budget to the science budget. <laughs> so if you're, if you're going to do private space, curiosity isn't really the best way to, to, to found your business model. It's just, it's just uh, so if you can scare the hell out of them, they'll probably invest. <laughs> Uh, but really, it's the economic opportunity, the greed part. And I mean greed not in the way of, of, of gaining value at somebody else's expense, but greed in the way of trying to grow your economic base, the incentive and the motivation to grow wealthy. Um, the economic sphere of Earth has been progressively expanding um, throughout history, and it really was becoming evident that you know until the early 1900s, the economic sphere was really just you know, taped the plant. I mean, it was just growing plants and exchanging things on the planet. There really wasn't any third dimension to it. And then we started to see this third dimension start with aviation, Charles Lindbergh's flight. And then you had commercial aviation that still continues today up around this mark. And then where you look at the cluster of private capital right now, most of them dot-com billionaires, you know, Bigel uh, Bob Bigelow and Richard Branson with Virgin Galactic and Burt Rattan and uh, Paul Allen, uh, Orbital, SpaceX, and there's others in there like Jeff Bezos who started Amazon.com and he's got much more of a quiet thing going on, but he's doing amazing stuff. All of this capital is, is clustered right now in this personal spaceflight revolution. So what I'm working on is that one, is, is trying to move the economic sphere of the planet out in another order, order of magnitude. Staking a claim, getting to the moon, and trying to attract all of these guys up. So I really think that's the way it's going to go. And as I mentioned, the, there's a resource argument on the moon, not just exploration. And the amount of resources in the moon, I think, are phenomenal. Um, it's a whole other discussion. But it's not just volatiles. And the problem with volatiles in a business plan, volatiles meaning water, gases, you know, things that you kind of consume, consumables. The problem with the, trying to pitch the value of volatiles to go to the moon is that they're not important until the moon's important. Right? They're not important until space is important. So you can't just say, look at all the water on there. I mean, who cares unless the moon's important, unless you're actually at the moon or you have an infrastructure and you have a system in our economy, who cares, right? Because it's not important until it's important. It's just a scientific curiosity. So what you're looking for is an economic dipole that you connect in, in short-term economic terms from the Earth to the moon, something that makes sense now. And that's what, I'm, that's what I believe is actually there. So in creating a multi-planet civilization, it's not just about boldly going. It's about boldly staying. So we will boldly stay. Uh, first with our robots and eventually with our homo sapien life forms. But eventually merge. And uh, that's where I think homo spaciens will eventually come from. So thank you very much.
it so that they're, they're uh, and I would say with other things, what deteriorated, they can swim forever in the oceans. But our species haven't done that yet. Uh, it, it takes a certain amount of biological engineering is one thing to, to adapt this for other planets. The other thing is uh, O'Neill colonies. With them, you can make huge artificial worlds, you can spin them, of course, you can set them for so you can use a 1G environment. And you can even uh, use materials and asteroids, move them to the else, right? You do that. Now, there, some say, well, that they're precarious, but I mean, that's the early stage. You can imagine you're making the first almost as planets. So if I could maybe, I think, paraphrase your point, I'm not sure everybody's hearing you. Um, you know, one of the points, correct me if I'm wrong, is that, you know, I'm talking about multi-planet species, and Gerard O'Neill, who was mentioned, who was another mentor of mine, now lost, um, asked the question of his uh, graduate class at MIT, is the planet of a, is the surface of the planet actually the best place for an expanding technological civilization? So it kind of broke the mold of thinking we have to be on planets. Maybe one of the best places to be would be to make a technological home that would control the environment. And he came up with the concept of large-scale space colonies, like things that you could have 10,000 people in, and weather, and cows, and streams. And, and you can actually control the gravity. The other point was maybe on worlds where the gravity is so much different than on Earth, it's going to be a problem for us. Um, so I think the answer is, if you assume that we are us, you know, if I made the first point yes. about don't necessarily think about us trying to adapt to the environment, For but it, that's right, adapt <coughs> us to the environment, not the environment to us. And then of course the genetic engineering is coming in too. And and everything underlying, um, and this is a whole other discussion, but it's where the other university I co-founded came from, the Singularity University. Um, you know, I got excited about space, and I thought, you know, very smugly that, hey, space is everything. I mean, that's like the universe. So how can it be something bigger than space? Until I went through the catharsis of understanding, which was sparked by Ray, this gentleman, Ray Kurzweil, that we're, that the, the, the actual systems underlying everything that we were evolving into are actually not linear in nature, but exponential in nature. And that's a whole other subject to discuss, but you can look up a book called The Singularity is Near, um, and I'm not talking about it in a, in a, in a kind of a, 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 a religious sense, like that's the only way it could be. But the underlying theme is is pre, is is very demonstrable. That we live in an exponentially accelerating technological environment, and our minds are built to understand linear things. So we actually do not perceive exponential trends. We we we. Uh, think about linear trends. So we think, when I said 50 years ago we did that, and what are we going to do 50 years from now? That's kind of a test, because I think you were thinking linear, right? Because what I was presenting was linear. What were actually, exponentials look very linear at the very beginning, but they explode very quickly into asymptotes. So my point, I guess, is that since going into space is technological, and information tech based technologies are going to be impacting what we are as human beings, that I think the ability for us to be adapting very quickly to other environments is not so far away. Another question? Yeah. Yep. Uh, so when we can advance to add on a few, I guess, decades, we've gotten to a point of pretty comfortable space exploration. When does the private property question come up, and how is it dealt with? <coughs> or is there another model that might be used? So you're coming out for a beer, right? <laughs> so the question was or is about uh, private property, and uh, you know, at what point does that become an issue as we move out into space? Is that right? An issue or an opportunity? We have a civilization. Right, we have a civilization, and, and, and much of our civilization is, as, well, Western civilization for sure, certainly a capitalistic type of structure, is built on the concept of private property. Right? It's, a, it's fundamental to all the laws. Even the definition of common law, common, the commons, was the way that people shared common resources, the pasture, with everybody owning different cows. So there's this whole basis of law uh, that, that comes out of private property, which literally means ground, dirt, but then it's extended to other things like material things that we own. So uh, to many, um, uh, the, the question of can you own property on the moon or on asteroids or anything outside of Earth, um, 
So this is where we get back to those treaties I mentioned that are silent on the matter. Um, it does say that no sovereign shall basically claim right, for their own dominion. So you, when the United States landed on the moon and planted the flag, they, did, what, they didn't say this is United States territory. But what they did say is that this is a, uh, the first words out of Neil Armstrong's mouth when he landed on the moon in 1969 were, no, but I was, I was hoping somebody would say that. It wasn't that famous line. The first words were, Houston, tranquility base here, the eagle has landed. It was later that he said the famous words, that's one small step when he went down the ladder. So the, the he made a declaration. Houston, sovereign, my sovereign, tranquility, which was the, air, the, the crater they were by, base here, active now, now, U.S. base, the eagle has landed, we have presence. So he, in those few words, which were carefully crafted, he described imminent, imminent domain, the right of, of peaceful occupancy, that there's a base, and that there is a right of non-interference. So in, in, in legal terminology, any lawyers in the room that can kind of start? So in legal terminology, it's called, or at least it's space legal ter terminology, it's called an exclusion zone. So it's the right of peaceful operation, a right to, like, don't mess with my stuff. I'm here for peaceful purposes. Um, and that's a big question for us in the private sector, because the first thing that I'd like to do, um, I talked about the technical barriers. The big barriers are political and legal. So as a Trojan horse, you know, when my lander lands on the moon, it's actually going to, I hope, be declaring some very reasonable um, uh, uh, duplications of what the governments did when they first landed. So we will, as a private company, say, Bob's base here. <laughs> we won't call it Bob's base, I don't think, but something like that. And then it's going to be a question of, well, how much of the base is reasonable? You know, um, is it just the area under the lander, or does it extend a certain amount of area? And then you get into the idea of operations and peaceful barriers of don't come so close to me, this is my area. And we have some terrestrial analogs up in Antarctica, trees, how you actually agree to get along. And that, and that chapter has yet to be written on the moon or anywhere else. So I think the question of private property, and I know people who that question is near and dear to, that absolutely want to lay claim to a reasonable part of title uh, on the moon. Um, you can buy titles any day on the internet. They have no legal bearing, they have no legal me meaning. Uh, part, you know, because part of all common law is, is you know, you, you have to prove, you have to prove imminent domain, you have to use, prove presence. And uh, if you look at the way that the mining industry has evolved, I think there's going to be something very similar. Uh, in mines, uh, when, you, when you establish a claim, there's basically two rules. Uh, one is that um, you need to defend your turf, right, you need to actually be there. You can't just say that's mine, you actually have to have presence. And you have to use it or lose it. So you can't just like walk away and, and you have to actually use it. Right? So possession is nine points of the law, it's true, and then use it or lose it. So I think those will be guiding principles as we occupy the moon for commerce and science. And there was a question. One last very quick question. Actually, we're right back to you. Yeah, one last one. I was just wondering, you said early on, that the lawyer is talking. Not yet. I'm not yet a lawyer. <laughs> Can't say I am. Okay. But early on you mentioned, uh, sort of implied that it was obvious why the common law would be the most suitable legal system for um, beyond earth law. But I don't, and, and on the basis that precedent allows the law to grow based sort of organically. It allows the law to grow on what has come before. Right. Sort of evolve. But that is inherently backwards looking. In order to have, to decide a case based on precedent, there has to be a case that came before. But it seems to me that there's no case that's come before, so how do we decide the first case? So I don't know how that, yeah. I, I get, well, I'm seeing a disconnect the there. And, and so what I'm working so hard on these days, and for the last three years, is actually to make that first case. To get, 
to get an actual ro robot on the moon that's an extension of my company and and to and to declare stuff and to, and to break and to break that chicken so, so to become the to become the chicken on the moon <laughs> so we actually it is it, it's, it's the first hook it's the first precedent and the, and the things that we declare as a company will be very carefully crafted to mimic but but expand the thinking that has occurred before so we do have precedence of what governments have done. And what we're going to do is create those first cases that create the precedence of what the private sector would do. So we, so it's all theory until somebody does it. Right? So I'm hoping that Moon Express will be the first one to actually stir up the pot a little bit. Yes. Can I follow that? Follow on question. Sorry. Yeah. If that's and, and I accept that argument, but then what jurisdiction decides the case when the moon isn't the jurisdiction of any country. So we have an example. I mean, we have to work that stuff out in space right now. You know, the International Space Station is a multinational space station. So, you know, if the Indian astronaut goes psycho and stabs the Russian guy in the U.S. <laughs> module, <laughs> <laughs> the, exactly. So we're, we're so the so. <laughs> But we also have some precedent in uh, the law of the sea, you know, where ships fly flags, and and whatever flag you may be in international waters, but the laws the laws that are imposed on you are those that come under the flag that you're flying, because that ship is tied to a sovereign country whose laws you are, are responsible to, and that's the case for every space ship that flies as well, and every launch license is granted that is currently granted for a spaceship um, is granted only by a sovereign, by a country. And and the, the the treaty, what the treaty does do, the 67 treaty, is that the ultimate liability for whatever that citizen or that company does that's subject to <coughs> that sovereign is the responsibility of the sovereign. So the country is responsible, infinitely responsible for any potential damage forever that that launch may occur, because things stay up in space a long time. So if I launch something into space next Tuesday that comes down in 2015 and takes out the Coliseum, and right, I've launched it from the United States, the U.S. is liable. So, so there is this uh, interesting legal concept that's the other side of the coin. Because there's perpetual liability in space, there's no concept of salvage. There's also there's protect, there's, there's permanent liability, there's also permanent title. So everything that's ever been put into space, all the assets, all the stuff on the moon, is all still owned. It's not salvage. It's not like the sea where you can, after so many years, you can go and it's yours if you get it. No, everything that's on the moon is owned, and the title continues perpetually. And that's why my friend Richard Garriott, um, who was one of the first private astronauts at the space station, if you look up, up on the web, you can find that he's the only citizen of the planet that actually owns something on the moon. He bought one of the Russian rovers that went there in the 70s. 60s, 70s, Lunacot 2. He owns it. He's got the title. So he owns that thing. Right? It's his. And he paid money for it. And he's got clear title. And, and he doesn't want anybody to mess with it. And so he's trying to do his own sort of um, expanding of the legal sphere around that premise as well. So there is some private sector premise, and he's it. So is that the. Oh, that's fantastic. So I, I would invite everybody to continue questions. We're going to go over to Michael's. So let's thank Bob Richards again. For